So first, I want to start with an observation about quantum thermodynamics and heat engines. Are they good for anything? So you see, Ferdinand showed us a heat engine, and you could ask, okay, why did he go through all this effort? So the main reason he had great fun, because uh, you could think, okay, why do we need a quantum heat engines or refrigerators? And the answer is simple, because this is my laptop. I want it to be a quantum computer. So why can't this laptop be a quantum computer? And if you go and see an IBM machine or you go to the Google machine, what do you see? You see a barrel this big and a chip this big. You see the dilution refrigerator. So you see a huge macroscopic thing that cools something that's printed chip. So this, I can't carry this refrigerator if I want to. My, I don't have a walk, but I don't mind. That's, uh, I promise my next walk will be a quantum computer. So how do you do that? So in a way we saw that already, we can build quantum refrigerators. And if we want to build a quantum computer, it's the same type of hardware, we can build a quantum refrigerator. So you could say, Laser cooling is a quantum refrigerator. It has a big advantage on the dilution refrigerator because taking out entropy is ballistic. So if you miniaturize something, since entropy goes ballistic and not by diffusion, you can remove the entropy and send it to outer space and you can keep your device small. So in a way to want to think what's the future, uh, you can say quantum heat engines, it would be quantum refrigerators, and the idea is to miniaturize everything. So I'll have my next laptop will be a quantum computer, and my next watch, I promise you, will be quantum watch. So <clears throat> this goes to uh, you want to quant, yeah, but I put my iPhone in the bag so. Okay, so what I'm going to continue is really in, in the middle between what Nelly told us and Gabriel told and talked about before me. I'm going to think about the master equation from, from a dynamic point of view. In a way, the subject which I'm going to start with is the dynamics in quantum and thermodynamics. So this is thermodynamics has a name dynamics, but classical thermodynamics is a static or quasi-static theory. So when we do quantum thermodynamics, we started with a theory of open quantum systems. So I'm trying to summarize in a way what I told you last time, which will connect to what Gabriel said and what Kennedy told us. So you can say you start with the Hamiltonian. So this is the church of the Hamiltonian. We assume that there's a unitary that drives the world. And so this is the first idea that you can see there's a unitary. And I'm going to write it like that. So it operates on something. So it's a super operator. Formally, it's a Hilbert space, so we can use completely the same ideas that we learned about Hilbert space. So the only difference is that operators are replaced by super operators, and the normal operators are vectors. So we super operators act on vectors, and operators, they form a Hilbert space, and we use that, and what we need for our Hilbert space is only Scalar product. So scalar product between two operators is a trace A negative. And you can prove for itself that this has all the properties of scalar products. And the whole idea of Hilbert was once you have scalar products, you can do expansions, you can do everything. So it's a linear operation. You have a Hilbert space. So all what we learned about Hilbert space is relevant. 
So this is the formalism I'm going to use. Sometimes it's called Louisian space, but it's Hilbert space. Okay, so this is our beginning. And then <clears throat> this is step one. And then we get a partition. We have a system in an environment, and we did a partition. And we go to the next step, which is what's called the reduced description. So we have the total density operator, and we have the density operator system, and we have the density operator the environment. And at time zero, we assume your output, which, as I said, is a strong assumption that not always you want to use, but we're putting out the assumptions where I'm going to be honest about. It. So once we have this assumption, so then you can say, okay, what's the reduced description for this? It's a trace over the environment, U or dagger. Or time zero if you want. I'll put the time here. So this will be more this the time. And for Carl Stocks, and again going back to Carl's, we can always can write it like that. Okay, and then put some index and sum with what we heard from Gabriel. So this is all what Gauss did. And it's written in one paper. I think it was his PhD thesis and then it disappeared. But we always remember him because we called him Gauss operators. And his motivation was quantum measurement. So in a way we're going back to that. So <clears throat> we have this structure and this is going to be our, what I call a dynamical map. It takes us from time zero to time two. So that's our dynamical map. And it's if we put this assumption, we can always write it as a Gauss law. Okay. And then Gauss is 1970. Then come GKS, mathematical physics. It was a small club. So it was, as I said, we're waiting to suppose it was Gaussian on the one hand that worked together and Lindblad, which worked alone, but they're not separate. Now Lindblad, I remember meeting him, he was quite quiet person, he didn't like to interact too much with people, but he corresponded. So he wrote them and they wrote back. So this was, I don't think he ever met them, but at the same time, 1970, Five, they came out with once he assumed this, he can write the master equation, which we saw is the commutator of the component, which is a unitary part plus the dissipated part, which is write it with the dumb operators, which is what we like to call them. And by commutator index here, and what we saw from what Gabriel showed us. So the only assumption is, is this: that there's some Hamiltonian somewhere in some environment, and you trace the environment out. And this is a structure. Now, why is it important? Because rarely we derive an equation. Because if you derive an equation from first principles, which we can do, so you can say the master equation was first derived by Bloch, and it's called Redfield because Bloch had so many things that he allowed Redfield to have the 
name after that. And also by, you can see Lippmann, and then, and it was derived. But the, a derivation is always full of assumptions. And what's good about the structure that you can guess. So we always guess. We don't like to admit that and say, oh, we need to fundamental, but it's much better to guess. So that when we guess, we want some rules. So the rules is, if we want Markovian dynamics, if we take the structure, we know we're trace preserving. So what's called PCP map, this map is called trace preserving completely positive. Completely positive, it means it's driven by some Hamiltonian, so it's not out of outer space, at least there's some physical background out of it. And <clears throat> so if we use a structure, we know we preserve probability, then we can do things like the statistics, we can do other things. So we know we're at least on solid ground. But then the question is, once we have this equation, is it equivalent with thermodynamics? And the answer is no. I can write the length of the equation, and it's easy to do that because if you like write the block equation, which is what was described, a driven two-level system, and you write the length of the equation like that, there are certain points that you would violate the second law of thermodynamics. What do I mean? Do I mean <clears throat> if you think about this, if I have a driven system, the only thing that can do is dissipate because they take work and I generate heat. I can't get the opposite. Now, if you look at block equation and you drive it at certain points, not always, so most of the time it's okay, but you can find corners and you drive it and you get the opposite. You get heat going into work. So by itself, if you write the end of the equation, you're not guaranteed that you're going to get a thermodynamic consistent problem. So, in order to do that, we need additional assumptions. So, we can say, okay, what, what assumptions do we need to add to this construction in order so it will be consistent with thermodynamic? And what I what I used, which is again an idealization. And the same that is used in thermal operations, the strict energy composition. I said, if I have an Antonian system, environment, coupling, nothing accumulates here. So, as we said, this is a constant movement. The energy is either in the system or in the environment. So this is a constant. So what do we get out of that? <clears throat> so now are we still using the, the interaction condition? So yeah, so so we, we have so H would commute with H S and H S is one symmetry, or you can say H commutes with H is the same. Or this means it's this. So it's the same symmetry, and this is the dynamical symmetry of the phase invariance that there's no time associated. And you know, this the consequence of this is the dynamical map, the full dynamical map of the system, and the unitary map, I'll write it like that, it's the commute loss. So <clears throat> this is where I left you last time. So this is a consequence of strict energy conservation. This is one consequence of the dynamical map and the three unitary map. And I can define the three unitary map as e to the power minus I only system Hamilton. And this means it operates in the <clears throat> So this is, you could say, a dynamical version of what we would call thermal operation. So instead of looking at 
<laughs> the other thing that we want to use is the relation between the math. So I start with an integral form in its differential form, which is a master equation, and I can define L as this. This is the formal definition of the generator, the movie BDN. And you can see if I can write my map that, then this is, you can say, trivial. But that means that my map is time independent. And I want to be more general. I want to have non Markovian dynamics. I have want to have things explicitly time dependent. So this definition is stronger. And you can see what it means. In order to have a generator like that, I have to be able to have an inverse, an inverse of the map. And this is a mathematical inverse. It doesn't mean that the map, the map has an inverse because if it's irreversible, if it's unitary, it's trivial. Then if there's time reversal symmetry. But if I do dissipated dynamics, it's not trivial that there is an inverse. And when you do sometimes, you can, when you try to calculate that there are certain, you could take spin, you could take the James Cummings model, and you can say this is the spin of the system, this is the environment, you can solve it analytically, and you can put it in a form of a limited equation, which is non Markovian, but so what? It still has the same structure, which I'll talk about in a minute. And when you look at this, get the generator, there are certain points in time. That you can't do this thing. But that's not so bad. If there are only certain points, you jump over them. Now you can say when you go to infinity, you can't go back. Because you reached equilibrium, there's no information on the initial state. So this inverse has no meaning. So again, you have to be a little careful about this ability to have an inverse, and then you have. This medium, which in a time independent case you can write like that. Okay, so now we have to have a structure of a medium which obeys these conditions. And the main condition it has to obey that these two have to be. Now, this is an integral form that they can always go to the you see to the generated form. So this generator here is L, and this generator is H. So they also have to be. Because this is a function. You see, this is the function of this, this is the function of this. The so two operators commute, their function is analytic also. So we have this condition, and this H carry H is what we describe the H of its operator, the common. And this is the full green equation for the master equation. And typically we decompose L in the Hamiltonian part, thus the dissipated part. Which also means I could replace this L by B. So I can say the dissipated part in a thermodynamic setting has to commute with H. Okay. So I have a structure which is thermodynamic consistent. So what can I do with this one step further? So what happens if I have two operators that they have a common basis set? So this tells me something that's at least very relevant. I know what is the eigen operators of the Louisville operator. I know they should be the same eigen operators as you can say the free dynamics. So this is easy to do. And so let's take an example and try to take these ideas and use it. 
for an example of the position. Well, use the same example that everybody's using. Use my omega sequence. This would be my Hamilton. So this minus i time of danger. So I want to calculate now what's its eigen operators of this right? eigen operator. Thanks. L. So we'll see them in the minute. These will be the jump, jump, jump operator. It should give me something. So this is an eigenvalue equation. So what are the eigen operators of my, you could say my commutation. So we know what they are. What happens if I operate with this on zero, so what do I get? It commutes zero. So if I take omega decimal. And the same for one one. So I get two eigen operators, which are invariants. They don't evolve in time because they commute with the Hamiltonian. But I need them in my limit operator. So I have already, I found two operators that I will use. And then I have, in this case, two more. So if I take SC and I take one zero, what's the commutator? You check me. Have the other one, I didn't make a mistake. What would this give me? This, this is plus, that should be mine. Depends how I write sigmas as S. So I get for the spin, I get four operators that are eigen operators of my, you can say my propagator, my free evolution propagator, but I also know they're eigen operators of my dissipator. Because this is what I just told you, it's thermodynamic resistance. So it means in a minute I'll construct my master equation out of it. <clears throat> that, now, more than that, this is a complete set. So I have a complete set of operators that I can expand any other operator. Now, why is this relevant? Because if I know what my coupling to the path is, I, need, I can calculate, let's say, the coefficients, the third the kinetic coefficients will be the overlaps with these set of operators that I'll have in my limited operators. So I'll reach that in a minute. But what's important, I have a complete set of operators that describes my Hilbert space. If it's a two-level system, I would have four operators. If it's a three-level system, I have nine, and so on. So this is another what's called Hilbert Schmidt space. Okay, so if I have these, now I can construct my dissipated part, and they have exactly the same eigenvalue. Now you can see there are two types. There's this type, the invariants, which are degenerate, which means that they have some freedom how to use them, 
And the ham, the nanan variant comes with only seven pairs, which are conjugated. So if I now want to write the most general, you can say <clears throat> Lindblad master equation for spin, which is consistent with thermal dynamics. So you could say you only have four terms for the density. So you could use the same. We'll have a sum of four terms. I'll use this notation. And I'll put your kinetic coefficients. And let's say this would be L1, L2, L3, L4. These will be now. I give you homework to check that if these operators are orthogonal, then if I stick your LK, and I go through this motion, their eigenoperators are about to possibly dissipate. So it's a little bit, it's not obvious because you could say I have something that looks cumbersome that they are. So we were able to take the structure of the GKLS equation and impose on a thermodynamic constraints and get a master equation that's thermodynamic consistently. And we have this freedom, we can choose these kinetic coefficients, which we want something addition. We want it to obey detailed balance. Eventually it will reach thermal liquidity. And there's already a hint that tells us how to do that, because we can say these two parts here don't change anything. They don't, they commute to the homophobia, so they won't. Uh, Lead to you could say to uh, the fixed point, but what will they do? What are these two first terms here? They commute to the Hamilton, and the and more than that, you can see that there these operators are emission, these operators are not emission. So, since they're emission, we can always write the Lindblad equation and for it, L. Is Hermitian, you can see the dagger falls off, and what we get here is a double conjugate. So, what we can build out of these invariants is always a double commutator, which I can write formally like that. In some range. So, these are out of the invariants, and I can always set it to look like that. So, let's call it D. Now put here D. So what do, do these operators? What does this double commutator mean? It's dephasing. It will keep the energy. So to, if the Gibbs state is a function of energy, it won't touch the Gibbs state because it's diagonal in energy. It will kill all the produces. So this structure of a double commutator, you could say is in this case is dephasing. It would be another, if it would be another operator, which is not, doesn't have to be the Hamiltonian, this is what you get when you do weak quantum measurements and you take into account the feedback. You also get the same structure as this double count. If I measure, you can say, what Gabriel was measuring, he was cheating. He was measuring non permission operators using blitz. So this detector killed the photon. But if I measure energy permission, Okay, a double coming. So we got the dissipated part, and you could say the rest, if I want to write it in the same, you could write it in sigma plus. And 
it would be this up and I would have a turn down. And in order to get the balance up divided by down, it goes. So I think this example, you can completely generalize it. What you want to do if you want to get a thermally correct master equation, you take your free dynamics, you calculate the eigen operators, you can build them out of the eigenvalues of the normal diagonalization, and they always come in pairs. And in order to equilibrate, it's sufficient that you equilibrate each pair separately. And then you, because that shows you that the fixed point will be correct, and that will equilibrate your system to thermal equilibrium. And what's the freedom you have here? How fast you're going to equilibrate? Again, that depends on the coupling to the input. That you have a structure that's thermodynamically consistent of a master equation, which has, you can say, the phasing term. And it has, you can say, uh, thermalization term that would lead us to uh, thermal equilibrium. And <clears throat> we have a feeling how to uh, understand it. Now, uh, okay, so okay. since I put it into input form, I made a mark of approximation. But I don't have to. Because if, if, I, if I start here, it's not. So what's it? The structure will stay the same. The difference is oh, so there is an assumption that I could do an inverse. And to non Markovian, you can see you could do it more generally. But once I have an inverse, it will have the same structure. Now, in Markovian case, these coefficients are positive. Not more polyon, these can be negative. And then. And then. And also the operators. But that's a, that's the next historical effect. If, if, if I start from the static Hamiltonian, non more polyon only means these ones because my Hamiltonian is static. If I'm going to have a driven system, then my Hamiltonian is dynamic, and then I have to multiply. My little bit of operators also. The non Markovian means that these coefficients can be negative for a certain time. So it means you could think about that I move the information into the back and to the back. So <clears throat> a way to do that, which is something you did as an exercise, we took the James Cummings model. And we said, okay, we want to write it like that. So, what, so it's a spin. I can write the spin. With the same master equation. And since I know the solution for James Cummings model, I can calculate what these coefficients are. And I can get the reduced description of the spin bottom problem only from the spin point of view. And the path is one point. So it's not completely non Markovian, but it has the same structure, the structural catches. Okay. So what's my next step? My next step is we need, yeah. I missed the step there. So you identify the both item of operators from the Hamiltonian part? Yeah. And then you write down the first term. Since we commute, we have to be also the dissipated. Right. But you have to regenerate L1 and L2. What? You have to regenerate item operators L1 and L2. I have four. One, two, three, four. Yeah, two of them are degenerate. Okay, so these are degenerate. So you could say I can take linear combinations of them. So to do this, I took a linear combination and built back the Hamiltonian. Because these are, you can say, 
Well, the invariants are projection operators of the Hamiltonian eigenstates. So I can always use them to rebuild the Hamilton. But you could have taken other linear. But I could take other linear. So there's a freedom here. And that depends. Sometimes you could say my dephasing is, in general, you should say some function of the Hamilton. So it will be a double commutator with some function of the Hamilton, which is whatever. Okay, that's where the physics comes. The, you can say, when do you know? If I do a measurement and my back action comes from weak measurement, then I know what to put here. So then it would be the Hamilton. This is what Gabriel was telling us in a way. If I can associate the measurement to that. But when you go back to Bloch, he didn't do a measurement. He knew there's purity phasing. So this term would be the purity phasing of Bloch. You could say the environment measures the coherence or the energy of the system, equilibrates it, and causes defects. <clears throat> okay. So I have a structure, and the structure is very strong. This is what I'm trying to do. The, the details can change depending on the physics. Now, <clears throat> My next step is to do a driven system. As I told you, the block, the driven block equation is not consistent by itself as thermodynamics. We have to modify that. And there are many ways to do that. And if you want to be consistent, you have to do something, you have to calculate Lindner operators that will be consistent with the drive. So the idea is. We want to think just about the spin system that you go to address picture. So if you get these middle operators from address picture and you put them into your master equation, then they'll be correctly correct. But you can think about it in a slightly different way. I'm not going to go through it because technically it's not more than. So, what you do is here is my system, here is the environment, and in this case, I'll put my driver here. So I'm driving my system with a controller. So this is going to cause a time dependence on my system. And I have a passive environment. And what we said about environments that they're passive in the sense that their density operator, we assume is thermal. Now our controller, if it would be thermal, it's dead. There's nothing going to happen. Everything is controlled. So we need coherence here. And as I told you last time, coherence is a totally is preserved. So what we do when we think about it, we move coherence from here to here. So we drive our system. <clears throat> okay, so the to do to try to sketch up what you do here, you treat this. Separately, you try to find, you can say the free evolution of this combined part here. Calculate the eigen, you can say, operators of this to build into your Lindbergh equation. You then trace out the, the drug. Now, the way you go it, you go to the interaction representation and make it always right. The free evolution that's called everything here the device, and then interaction representation as this times this and the interaction representation, which is induced by you can say the free evolution of my product. The fact that the other drive which does not conserve. Okay, so laser drive you put here. That's a difference. Right. So there's a different symmetry. The questions were so 
and objects you put it outside because you say this is not influenced by the yeah. So it's a different symmetry. You get different mass particles, and also different definition of work because you, you put things instead of. But it's a similar way. I can put that here, and then I will write. So I will put here another partition. So when you trace out this, eventually you can approx approximate a, this is a time dependent property of the system. So this is, you could say to, to do this smooth here, you need the semi-classical approximation. And what you get, you can say the generator of this is a time dependent unit. So this is the question when you, you when you typically do a drive, we think of a semi-classical approximation or a drive has laser with a million photons and we don't care n plus n1 and minus and we treat this drive semi-classically. And then we can think about this as a time dependent kind of thing. So you can always go from here back here, figure out the drive that will do that. And so there's certain approximations that we do that. But if we do that, our, you can say our unitary obeys the Schrodinger equation. And this unitary here is U dagger operator. So once I have a time dependent Hamiltonian, I can solve for the propagator. And then what do I do? So again, to be consistent with thermodynamics, if you do this analysis, you find out that I need the eigenoperators of this time dependent propagator which comes from a time dependent Hamiltonian in the Heisenberg representation. This is so you solve the propagator in the Heisenberg representation, for, and you find the eigenoperators in the Heisenberg representation, and then they become your time dependent Hamiltonian jump up. So it's a little bit more complicated procedure. If you want to go back to that, you have to solve for the free dynamics. You get the operators off of that, and you find the eigenoperators of the free dynamics. They're time dependent. So you get the same structure with time dependent and operators here. So even when your laser is in, you know, pumping lots of photons, semi classical limit, you, you put HD inside the environment. It's a, it's so even though it's no, storage. so if it's a laser, if it's a laser, I will take this out. So if it's a weak source, then you it doesn't, it. So then I will put another partition. Right, but if it's a weak source, it okay, will... the way it, you would say it can in the limit of perturbation when it's very weak. So and that's why in most cases people I would say abuse the master equation because they take lens up and they put what they want. And does it work for them? In most cases, yes. Because they don't go very far. You can say the driving is very weak, so yeah. so so far. Yeah. But when I have strong driving, it can't work. And you could say, if you would want to think about an experiment, you take an NV center and you drive it strongly. And then you can ask, okay, what does the driving influence T1 and T2? Yes, there's been experiments that prove that. So this is, you can say a verification that you just can't take the Lenko equation for without driving and use it. If the driving is weak, sure, you can go on, do that. But if the driving is strong, it should influence the dissipation. Now, <clears throat> oh, so, you could say what, 
we learn from here that we can derive master equations, Markovian and non-Markovian master equations, which are consistent with thermodynamics. We have a recipe that does that, and the recipe is based, you could say, on this invariant on the dynamical system. So why did we go through all this effort? So you could say the reason is many times trivial. When we started to think about quantum heat engines, we wanted to do the standard one. So we did Kalnoff. And we did Kalnoff for a qubit. And then auto simpler. So we moved to auto. But if you think about the auto cycle, which is not true really what Erdin was telling us, in the auto cycle, the dissipation and the unitary moves are separate. So either I do a unitary or I do thermalization. So my limit equation is static. But in the Carnot engine, when I'm connected to the bath, I move my Hamiltonian, I change my Hamiltonian. So I need a master equation that follows my drive. And in a way, this is when Ferdinand does his experiment, that's a situation you are because you're driving it while you're dissipating. And there is an effect like that, which basically mixes, you can say, the unitary part with the dissipated part, like you have in front. So it took us many years to derive this just so we could do the Carnot engine for a two level system. So why not? Okay. So now we have tools. And I want to jump to back to engines and talk about friction. We said that our model only had thermalization. So now we need friction. So what is quantum friction? Before that, I want to sorry. Before I go to friction, I want another example. Sorry about that, you know what we'll talk next, but they want to go back to this and give you a simple derivation of a master equation that will take me this amount of space. And in a way, this is the first master equation that appears. It's a work of uh, uh, Lippmann and uh, Okay, so what's my model? Here's my spin. Which this M of one. Now my environment will be also composed of spins. And you could say that would fit this idea of uh, thermal operation. So I have a gas particle that each one is a spin, but it can be anything. You know what? I don't know. Each one, to make it closer to thermal operation, I'll say they have the same kind of some environment. Now, my particles, you could say each one of them. Environment. That's one. Is H E. They're all the same. So I have gas of dilute particles all in the same temperature. And what happens? They collide. So they collide with my system. And there is one assumption here that each one collides separately. So this would be the, you want to think about this quantum jump. Once in a while they collide with my system. And they collide and go away. So you could say, my environment density of is composed of all of these. 
but each one of the particles is a quantum to the whole system. Is that what it is? No, these don't have to be anything. Uh, don't have to be any Hamilton. They just have to be turbulent. Okay, well, so, so they collide with my system. For, for the system, I'll keep it. Just to get the same answer equation, I'll keep the same energy. Okay. So what do we know about this? We know, okay, this is collided. So, so how do we describe the collision? By an S matrix. So what is an S matrix? It's a unitary transformation that tells us what happened before and what happened after. So you should say, out, S dagger in, this is the definition of an S matrix, the scattering event. And there's something else that the scattering event has to commute a base strict energy constitution. And the idea that a particle comes from infinity, does what it does, and then goes back. So the interaction is basically eventually turned on, turn off, there's a switching, but eventually nothing accumulates in the interaction because it goes through two. So a scattering event automatically obeys strict energy conservation. So now <clears throat> we want to build a master equation. I do a derivation when it's not assuming energy. So I say, okay, before I took one particle, I have S and it's was its, let's say, E1. This is all in. All out is S or S. So I can say, what's the rate of change? I say the collisions are discrete, but I can think about what's the rate of change, which would be the change involved. So to this without minus n. And So this would be the rate of change per collision. And now I can get a master equation. I can write it, I can guess it like that from the system. That's okay. To get the change in the system, I should just take the trace. So if I want the change that happened to the system, it's a trace over the environment. Of this event, it's a blow out, and the trace of blow in, I can throw this away. So this in before. So then, you know what? We have to do so much to write it up here. Given that S commutes with your total energy. That's kind of semi classical. No, it's strict. That's always a collision. It's not semi classical. Just I mean, if you, if you have like a high energy scattering experiment. It's the same. We come from as asymptotic and go away. S matrix always commutes. Ah, but you have a strong coupling regime where it doesn't. Yeah, but that's where you could say that, that the hidden, there's always a hidden assumption. The hidden yes. assumption that the collisions are rare. So a collision starts and ends before the next one. This is a hidden assumption. So there's a time scale. That's why you could say it's a limit of dilute gas. What does it mean in terms of delta x? Of what? What does it mean in free energy? Does it change now under your process? Yeah, I'll show you to get the same master equation. I'll get the, the final line will be the same. This is so you can say the same master equation could come from different derivations. So this is a certain derivation. So what do we see? That the change is a rate of collision to talk about like that. And then I have the trace of the environment. I have a lot S.
I can write it like that. And here are what I forgot. My estimate. So this is the master equation. This is called a Poissonian master equation, and the Lindblad know about it. In the paper of Lindblad from 1975, he refers this as the Poissonian limit of a master equation, which has the structure. You have the rate of collision, and you have, let's say, you're averaging over the environment. Now you can ask, okay, what's the fixed point of this? Uh, of this master equation. When does this change if the change is zero? You immediately can see when all this is also thermal, what happens here, this commutes, because here we have, we can write these two things as e to the power of minus beta, same temperature, Hs plus He. And our assumption that the S matrix commutes was that. So it's invariant, and then we get zero. So the fixed point of this, this collision model is a thermal state. And okay, so this is completely general. You can say, oh, what I used here, that there is some collision, some collider. Now, in order to be more explicit, if I want to, you have to say something about the environment. So the easiest thing to say about the environment, it's also spins because then you can do this with S matrix and the trace explicitly. But in a way we have a structure. You can write this a little bit differently. You can write this as a Gamma, the trace with the environment. And this I can write as e to the power of i. Some Hermitian generator of the S matrix. I some phase. You can always write any unitary as a power of a Hermitian matrix or G Hermitian. And as I said, G commutes with HS plus HG. Times, you can say, okay. the trace of that. And now, what sometimes people do explicitly say, okay, it's a weak collision, so this phase change per collision is very small, and you can expand it to first order or second order, and then take the trace explicitly. This is done, you could say the paper of another um, which does that. But, oh, in a way, we know the result. We know that this, since it's a thermal master equation, it has to have the same structure as before. It has to, you say, only the SD. Which is our component part, and we have the dissipating part, and the dissipating part has to have the same structure. So the only thing that went going from here to this same master equation before, we just have to calculate the kinetic coefficients. So if this is, then it's easy to do that. Otherwise, for general scattering, it could be more complex, but we already know the result. So the only thing that's left is to say, okay, how fast does it equilibrate in this collision? So, so this is a derivation. The advantage of this derivation is that you can use it for unraveling. And the idea, when you do a computation, you don't want to do computations in the density matrix formalism because you, you're treating a matrix. So when you do unraveling, also when you do it, you try to keep it as a wave function not as a, a density operator. And using this collision model idea, you can do that. You can say, once in a while there's a collision, the collision changes the wave function, but you all the time, in between collisions, you have a 
completely Hamiltonian dynamics. So you solve the time differential Schrodinger equation. When you have a collision, you calculate this S matrix, this event, you know something happens. So you do a, a jump and then you continue. So you get those different types of linear gradient, which is efficient because you treat equations. Gamma there is a rate of collision. Yeah. And this would depend on the temperature also. Okay, so that's. And it could be that you could say that's a, in a way depends on the density of the gas and also temperature or whatever. Okay, so this this derivation was done by calculus and and Ligma, and it's not a calculus that you know in Harvard. It's his brother. That was his PhD and uh, from nineteen forty nine or something like that. How much time do I have? Well, you're going to read the, the ring here. So, okay. Yeah. So, how much time? Okay. Okay. So, I'll, I'll start my next subject so we can think about the problem type, which is fresh. And in a way, I already told you what it is. Because last time I said that if we want to generate coherence, it costs work. And what is friction? That we lost this coherence. So if we generated coherence and then we dissipated it, so then we lost it. So we used work to produce coherence and then we dissipate it. So we have a loss term which is related to our drive. So we can think when I don't have, this is my scenario, when I don't have friction, when I do things very slowly, adiabatically, both quantum mechanically and thermodynamically. If I'm adiabatic, there's no coherence. I drive, change my Hamiltonian very slowly, and my system, according to the adiabatic theorem, follows my Hamiltonian. So if I start a thermal, it will stay thermal on my trajectory. That changes. But if I want to drive fast, and I always want to drive fast, except here that uh, I was warned that the police here are, are vicious, so you don't do that to So, but still, I like to drive fast. So then I'm going to generate coherence. So once I generate coherence by itself, it's not friction yet because I can always, re it's a unitary, I can always reverse it and cash on my coherence and gain it back. And I think we heard that from Nicole yesterday. She was cashing on the coherence and entanglement and getting work out. So you can do it both ways. But once I dissipate, once I have this double commutator with a Hamiltonian, then it's lost. So, so when do I expect friction? First of all, I have to think about I have a time dependent explosion scenario. And in order to be non adiabatic, the Hamiltonians at different times should be computed. So then, if I drive slowly, I follow the adiabatic, I stay in the energy shell. But if I go fast, so then I'm not. You can see the extreme example is what's called sudden. So let's say I have my harmonic oscillator, which we had before, and I change from this situation instantly. So if I was like that, and I did it instantly. So here where I was in an eigen state of my Hamiltonian, here I am. So I instantly generated coherence. I made a squeeze state of my new Hamiltonian. Why is that? Because in the harmonic oscillator, the kinetic energy and the potential energy don't commute. So if I change my potential instantaneously, I reach to this situation. Now, if I go from here back, suddenly I'll reach the state. But now if I couple this to a bad, I lost my coherence. And that's friction. So 
I think next time I'll do it. I'll take a, uh, an example. I'll work through this, and you can see that the origin of friction is non-adiabatic behavior, and it behaves like classical friction. If I want to drive faster, I pay more to the police here, right? Is it linear? Yeah, I'm very sorry. Yeah, you know, okay, we, we hopefully now we're taking a bus, so it's not on my, my yeah. Okay, so maybe I gave you a preview of my next talk, so I'll stop here for questions. So maybe a, a question, as I said, the bus takes plenty of time. Yeah, right so you describe it now with the humble state, but if you go to spin picture, you have to talk to the, the spin and rotate the spin and then you measure it in another axis and you feel it could be resistant. That's exactly the same. So they're completely analogous. So if if I can keep my Hamilton is the same direction, they commute. But if I change my direction, they don't commute and then I'll get, you can see friction. Or that with them. Okay, so let's stop here. You gather your stuff, go to your room, make the changes you like. Okay, there's, um, I think, fairly light.